Hello everybody, welcome to Find My Past From Home. My name is Ellie, I'm the Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. If you're new here, welcome. If you've not joined us before, Find My Past From Home is our free series of video interviews, webinars and presentations, some of which are from our, from our own in-house experts and others which are from really, really talented external contributors. And if you're not familiar with Find My Past, we are a family history website and we aim to provide you with the tools, the know-how and the inspiration to find out more about your ancestors' stories. Really exciting. So today we're going to be talking about a little well-known, she should be more well-known, uh, World War One heroine, Edith Cavill. And I'm delighted to welcome our two guests for today. We have Father Peter Dole of Norwich Cathedral, and we have Nick Miller of edithcavill.org.uk. So welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you, Ellie. It's lovely to be with you. And Absolutely. you as well. It's a real, 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 real privilege from our perspective. Um, Father Peter, can I ask you if you'd like to introduce yourself to our community, first of all? Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, Peter. My, I'm the canon librarian at Norwich Cathedral. Edith Cavill is buried at Norwich Cathedral and her memory and her life are very precious to us and it's part of my responsibility is is um, honouring that memory and interpreting it for visitors. Fantastic and Nick over to you if you wouldn't mind telling our lovely community a little bit about yourself. Well I came to live in this village about 27 years ago and it is the village where Edith was born and grew up. It's called Swordston. It's in Norfolk, not a million miles, about four miles from the cathedral. And we have very strong links with them and Peter. Um, and I have been looking after what we hold about Edith Cavill and been adding to it really year after year till my house is full of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm the archivist for the church uh, in our village, St. Mary's Church, Swordston. And I, as you said earlier, I run a website about her called www.edithcavill.org.uk. Fantastic. Thank you. So we've already got some people coming in the comments saying hello. We've got Victoria. We've got Linda. We've got, we've got um, another Linda saying can't join you today. She's got Zoom stuff. Hopefully you can catch up later, Linda, because all of you watching live, that's fantastic. But you can also catch up on demand as well at any time from the video section of our Facebook page or from our YouTube page. And just a little thing of what we're going to be talking about today. So we are going to be, going to be talking about Edith Cavill. We're going to be discussing a little bit about her life, her time during World War I. We're going to be talking about her legacy and there will be time for questions at the end. Now, if you do have a question for either of our guests about Edith, um, please pop it into the comments. And I'd like you just to put the word question at the beginning so we can easily see the questions and we can answer some of them towards the end. I do have another little ask of you all at home as well. So Nick in particular is really keen to know if anybody watching has a connection to Edith. Now whether your ancestor mentioned her in a diary or a letter or whether they were treated by her, maybe they have a photograph of her, who knows? Nick would like to know. Um, so Alex is in the comments. So Alex is going to put a link to Nick's website in there. Um, please contact Nick if you have a story for him. Now, Nick, I believe somebody has already done this, haven't yeah, they? Absolutely. Well, someone wrote to me yesterday or the day before um, using inquiry at edithcavill.org.uk and said, I have a relative who is known to have been a cook for Edith. That's all she said, cook for Edith. I said, well, that's interesting. Could have been here, could have been there, could have been this period or that period. Please, can you tell me where might she have been a cook and roughly what the dates are we talking about? And then I'll give you lots more information about the context. I'll send you to various books to look about the world that your cook, friend, predecessor, uh, lived in and the Cavill household that she will have known or the nursing situation in Belgium. So yeah, I love doing that sort of link up. So do we, we love it. Um, so yeah, please let us know if you've got anything you'd like to share 
uh, we want to hear from you. So I've actually, Nick, you provided me with some fantastic images. Um, so while we're going to be talking, I'm going to have these open. Um, so then what we can do is if we want to have a look at any of the pictures, we can do and we can flick through to them. Um, so let's make sure that's open. And there we go. That's the first slide there with some images. Um, Nick, I think you had a little bit of a story behind um, this colorized portrait. I don't know if you want to, uh, to share. Well, briefly, I will. I'd love to because it's so exciting. We've had a picture of the left hand black and white picture of Edith in the back of the church for donkey's years, long before my time. And it is the same size as the one on the right. And literally this morning, the amazing technical man who has managed to colorize it, as it's called, as per the one on the right, uh, is, has, has sent me that for use today and for use in future. Now, it really brings that first portrait alive, doesn't it? To see the skin color, to see the tie and all the rest of it. Um, the eyes are actually right because we know she had steely gray eyes. And uh, if you look in detail, that's that's exactly what he's picked up. So fascinating, probably taken about when she was about 30, probably just before she started to train as a nurse. There's a very interesting little type in there. And if any of your experts uh, on the other end are able to work out what that type in is, we'd be fascinated to know. We think it might be a Celtic image which links Edith to Norfolk to Boudicca. Now, how about that, the Icena? That would be amazing. I was actually <laughs> reading about Boudicca just yesterday. Well, she's another famous Norfolk figure, or maybe Suffolk. We're, we're, we're fighting about her still. <laughs> or maybe even Essex, really? don't we say. <laughs> um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention as well. Something else that's going to be on the, on the agenda for today um, is uh, a, a, a newish piece of evidence in Edith's story. And uh, Father Peter, you can hopefully shed some light on that and I believe you might have the evidence with you without spoiling it indeed. too much. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic so there it is yeah do you know what why don't we talk about that first actually because I think this is just really really exciting and um, so just to let everybody at home know this letter is actually written by Edith but I'm going to pass over to you, Father Peter, because you know more about this than me. Like, what is the significance of this letter? This is a letter that was donated to the cathedral absolutely out of the blue um, back in November, just, just in time for uh, Remembrance Day, really. Um, it, it came from Canada. Or a man called Greg Stewart had grown up in England but moved to Canada. He was friends with Roger Frith, who was a, a poet and a writer, who was a family friend of, of the Cavills. And he had inherited this particular letter, which uh, he felt you know, would more appropriately be back at home in, in Norwich. And um, it's a letter is remarkable for various reasons, perhaps most of all, because it's a letter that the last letter that Edith managed to write to her mother before she was arrested. Um, Edith was arrested by uh, German soldiers, uh, in Brussels, uh, arrested for being for 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 treason, for being accused of being a spy, and um, and aiding and abetting Allied soldiers who wanted to get out of Belgium. Uh, so this letter, which which is dated the twenty sixth of July, nineteen fifteen, uh, came just you know, about ten days before um, Edith was arrested, um, and it's it's full of lovely homely touches. She's writing to her mother, trying to reassure her because obviously she's in a war zone, a very different situation. She's an enemy alien uh, in, in the middle of territory occupied by Germans. Um, and Edith is trying to reassure her mother that she's, she's okay, that things are going all right. She's very busy in her professional work. Her, the clinic that she's overseeing and uh, nursing school is you know, moving house. So she's describing that work. Um, she describes her financial situation and, and wants to make sure her mother has access to money. Um, she's talking about uh, her dog, uh, Jack, who's uh, you know, a great favorite of all of them. And so it's, you know, it's all this reassuring news, but you can, 
you know, reading backwards in hindsight, you can feel this undertow of danger that, that you know, Edith is trying to settle things because she knows she could be arrested any time. Uh, you know, what, what she's doing is, is illegal and punishable by death. And so she's trying to sort things out as much as she possibly can, while still saying, we will meet again and I'll have lots to tell you. So it's a very moving letter, um, mm. uh, lovely in its detail, uh, but very poignant in, in the, the situation in which Edith finds herself. Absolutely. And um, Nick, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add about the letter in particular. Well, just one thing that the mother, Peter, referred to was living in Norwich, having left the vicarage here um, about seven, eight years ago. No, no, four years earlier. And uh, she's 79 and she's been worried sick ever since the beginning of the war. There have been one or two letters gone to and fro. We're not quite sure how Edith got them out of Brussels or how she got them back into Brussels in an occupied city. But there have been letters. There was one more letter, which I... I really, you know, this is so poignant. She wrote it on the night before she was shot and it was known to be, have been written and the Germans never were prepared to make it, put it in the public domain. So we don't know what the mother would have heard from her daughter on the night before her death. Her mother died uh, about two years later, um, somewhere else she moved off to be with her daughter because she was really failing. She, she never got over the death of her daughter. Yeah, it's very, very sad. Um, and just to say as well, if anybody would like to find out a little bit more about this letter, um, it, there's a, an article about it on the Norwich Cathedral website. And Alex, I believe I gave you that link earlier. So if you could put that into the comments for everybody, that would be lovely. Um, so the next thing I just want to talk about is a little bit about her background, because we might know that she was a, an everyday woman, an everyday nurse who met a really untimely and really sad end during the First World War. But people might not know about her background. So I thought that we could talk about that a little bit next. Um, so who was she, I suppose? What What is her background? I don't know which of you would like to take that to begin with. Well, I suppose from her village, I could have a go. <clears throat> Basically, she was the first child of four of the vicar of Swardston, the Reverend Frederick Cavill and his wife Louisa. And uh, she was born in the house which is on the screen in front of you. No, no, she wasn't. She was born in another house. She, this is the house her father built uh, soon after her birth. And this was the family home all her life. Uh, and it's, it's no longer the vicarage in Swardston, but it was a lovely vicarage. And through this, the, the trees on the left, you could, in an ideal situation, see the church where he took services for 46 years as vicar. So she grew up in a reasonably genteel environment. Um, I don't think there was a lot of money around with four children. Uh, and here's the father on the left, who was a fairly daunting looking figure, wasn't he? Um, he trained, <laughs> tra trained in theology in uh, Heidelberg in Germany. And here he is on the right hand side with the family and Edith is standing directly behind him, the eldest of the four, one brother, two other sisters and mother. And that's basically her background. Uh, the vicar as a village figure and the mother, her mother too, were very much involved with a small community of probably 250 people max. And uh, she, they would know almost everybody. And uh, when they learned of people who needed help, they were in there and so were the children. So Edith used to take Sunday lunch with her siblings round to elderly or sick parishioners who couldn't get one for themselves. Mainly a rural agricultural community, not a lot of wealth around, and that's the sort of world she grew up in. Till 16. Is that enough for the moment? Absolutely. I don't, before we move on, Peter, is there anything you would like to add? No, nothing, nothing so far. Thank you. Yeah, okay, okay that's, that's wonderful. Um, so I, I suppose the next thing to, to chat about is how she came into nursing, I suppose. I don't know if which of you would like to take that. Peter, go for it. Oh, well, Nick, I, I think you're much, much more on the ball. <laughs> <than that. laughs> 
basically, what does a 16-year-old do uh, with not much money and having to get out there and earn a living? So she became a governess. And that slide, thank you for the, the behind-the-scenes work here. Here's a uh, as a governess, all dressed up on the left-hand side. There is a dress that we were given a few, a couple of years ago, uh, which she wore. She was five foot three, and she had to dress smartly for tea in posh houses where she was the uh, the governess to the children. And that's a dress we know that belonged to her, and she wore, and may have made herself. The remaining stuff there is all the things that she did to occupy her time when she had any. She's a very good uh, painter and drawer, and you can see the watercolour of the birds, the etching of uh, a character. She did six postcards, uh, like the character on the left, and raised money for uh, a Sunday school in the church using those and selling them, uh, published by Jarrolds in Norwich. That's a picture of the church, which she must have painted uh, in her spare time, uh, and it looks just like that today. And on the right is a piano that was given us out of the blue. A man rang up and said, I've got this here piano in this garage and it's going on the skip, but they say it belonged to Edith Cavill. So I managed to see it and grab it from him. And it is now safely stored in, in Norwich in a very auspicious place. And uh, we know it's hers from things that we found from papers about the sale when the pe family left the house. On the seat are bits of music that she played, and very competent music it is too, very demanding. She was quite some lady, even at this age. Then, okay, oh, so I'm sorry, Nick, so could I add in there? I mean, it's, it's, I think that that story you alluded to about raising money for the Sunday school is quite, quite a telling one about, both about the family and about Edith herself, that her father, in a sense, commissioned her. She, he, he delegated to her the task of raising money to, to build this Sunday school. And so she got in touch with the Bishop of Norwich and said, well, you know, we've been asked to do this, uh, or I've been asked to do this, can, can you help? And the Bishop, in effect, wrote and said, well, if you can raise thus much money, then I will give you the rest. And then she proceeded to raise the money herself by, um, you know, doing these, these paintings and cards and writing letters uh, appealing for support. And this is something she was doing as, as, as a teenager. So, uh, you know, very early on in her life, she had inculcated this principle of being a person for other people. That, that's, that's how she understood her life and her purpose was to, to do things for people. Yeah, very well said. Yep. And she said to her cousin, who was a, a chap a little uh, older than her, uh, in a letter at about 22, 23, I can't remember exact year, she said... I know I want to do something more with my life. I want to do something useful for people. And look at that as an entree into nursing, because after having been a governess all over um, England and then uh, in Brussels for five years, in Brussels, so she got good French before she went. She got it even better while she was out there. That's You're going to see the link come up later to, to Brussels. Here she does, in 1895, she starts in a a sort of pre-nursing training school, and she goes to the Royal London Hospital, well, what's now the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel, and takes on being, quotes, a Nightingale-type nurse. Uh, age 30, I think I'm right in saying that it's probably, had she been any older, they would have said no. So she was just in by the skin of her teeth. She had looked after her father um, a little before starting nursing, so she knew a bit about uh, not only looking after children, but also looking after um, sick adults. Fantastic. I'm just going to flip through some of these pictures. Maybe you could talk about this chap. Ah, well, this takes us on a bit because having trained for two or three years in the London hospital, and by the by, having nursed a typhoid epidemic, we think we've got problems of a pandemic here. There was a typhoid epidemic in Maidstone, and one of her first tasks as a new trainee nurse was to get off down to Maidstone with 100 nurses from the Royal London and nurse the typhoid patients down there. Now, no PPE there, no nothing really, and they managed to sit on top of the typhoid and it uh, kind of you know dwindled. I think 150 people died altogether, but they managed to get on top of it. But uh, that's very interesting sort of parallel with the pandemic today. Anyway, she three, three years at the Royal London, 
then on to various nursing posts in mainly in London, but then latterly in Manchester. And she was always wanting to go up the nursing ladder to, to make a bigger impact, love training nurses and uh, teaching them. And this chap is a crucial player in Belgium, very big uh, cheese in the, in the uh, medical world, Antoine Depage, and he wanted Nightingale-style nursing in his hospitals in Brussels. And he wrote to friends, well, he talked to the, 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 the people that she'd been a governess for, saying, can you find me a Nightingale-trained nurse who can come over here and train from be the beginning? We've got no nurses here as such. All we've got is uh, Catholic nuns. Um, what we really need is these nurses that you have in England. Uh, and so they wrote to Edith. Edith said, well, might he be interested in me? The answer was he was. And hey-ho, 1907, she finally got up the nursing ladder and became in charge of the first nursing training in Belgium, in Brussels. And he was the man who, who asked her in. That's just incredible. Do you not think, I was I'm preparing for this session and doing some background reading, she just seemed to have such a can-do attitude. Yeah. Do you not think? Absolutely. I mean, I'm already fluent in French. I know Brussels very well. Um, I know some of the people that are on the uh, fundraising board for this uh, hospital. There's an open invitation here. I'm, I'm up for this. So off she goes. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a challenge that, that she had to face there, because not only was there this uh, you know, starting an institution from scratch, but there was a, a considerable culture of hostility against what she was trying to do. Because, um, you know, before that, you know, the, the Roman Catholic nursing sisters had really had uh, a monopoly on this work. And, but, you know, they, they, they had, you know, no, no sense of, of, you know, wearing, you know, particular hygienic clothing, um, of, of sanitation, of, you know, the, the just the, the basic standards of, uh, you know, nursing hygiene were unknown to them. And so the thought that this Protestant uh, English woman should be coming in and, uh, you know, taking charge of this really did promote a lot of hostility, both against, against her and against Dr. Depage. But, uh, you know, she saw it through. She proved the importance of what she was doing and, and 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 very soon the 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 school was attracting nurses not just from Belgium for, for, from France and Germany and all around it really you know its its reputation became set very very early on. Absolutely, I don't know if, uh, whether you've got any anything to say about this image at all. The image, yeah, this is this is what she was told. Here you are. This is where you're going to start your nursing. Uh, training base, as it were, and the, the house in which, or the houses in which the uh, nurses will live and you will live. Uh, they're, they're, it's a terraced group of houses in Brussels, uh, quite close to Depage's hospital. And there would be beds in one of the houses for patients. There will be uh, clinic places where they could see patients. There will be training rooms for uh, the nurses and there'll be a living accommodation for her staff who were needed to keep the nurses going and the nurses themselves. And at the back, there was a garden uh, for her and her dog, which was, we'll talk about later. But also, like many of these Brussels houses, there was a basement, and you'll talk about that later. This is all a story of, of jigsaw making. It really is, you know. If she hadn't had these houses with a basement, she couldn't have done all the things that she did later. I was going to say, like, already we're building up a picture of this woman and there's so many things about her early life and her upbringing and her tenacity that is going to play into how her life played out from here on in. So I think it's probably a good time for us to move on to her time during World War I. Um, so if I flick through these pictures, oh, that's another lovely picture there. Right. We're getting a bit established here, her and Depage and the nurses that she, some of the nurses she trained. Yep. Yeah. Ah, there's the dog. We'll talk about him later as well. But <laughs> I mean, 
into the story till 1910 when she picked him up as a stray on the streets. And this was the, sorry, the nurse training school is something later in the story. She was in the process of building. I mean, take a, this woman is multifaceted. She, she saw that that building that we've just seen was really inadequate for the future. And so she persuaded Belgian funders to give her money to get on and build. Could you go back to that one, the, the nurse training school? Uh, that's it. No, that was it. That's it. This is a substantial building, as you can see. She got the money together for that uh, and was overseeing the planning, the building, and all the rest. And almost up to the date that she died, no, no, to the date that she was arrested, literally they were moving the stuff from the old house that you saw just before into this building by cart because there were no, nobody. Mm or petrol and there were no uh, lorries, they'd all been taken to the front uh, by cart from one place to the other, getting this ready to get going as a nursing base and training school for nurses and all the other things we've just described. Thank you. I, I could read I could read to you the, 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 the paragraph from the letter that the, 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 That's the, relevant. the yeah. last letter she wrote, that she talks about this. She said to her mother, we move into the new school at the end of this week or the beginning of next. It advances rapidly now, and the nurses are nearly all there already. The patients will be moved at the last. The little garden in front is gay with flowers, and the cleaning is in progress. It is very dirty, as you may imagine, and will want going over many times before it is really nice, as the workmen are still in and are not likely to finish for some time yet. So that, that really bring, brings it home. Absolutely. Um, See the jigsaw. Yeah. Super. I just think it's wonderful that we've got little pieces of her of her letters and her her inner thoughts. I suppose I just think that's really really special for somebody who's no longer with us. And a lot of our community, I'm sure, at home, you'll feel exactly the same for your ancestors. It's really really magical, um, really emotional to have that little piece of them uh, in the form of a letter or a diary. Um, yeah, how did Edith, a nurse, come to be so involved in the First World War? Well, if I come back first, um, basically she was over here in Norfolk seeing old friends and her mother uh, in July, as she always did. And she got word from the nurse she left in charge of the old clinic saying, if you don't get back, you won't get back because of the war, which is just, just about to break out. So within, 36 hours of getting that letter, she was on a ferry from Harwich to Ostend, the last ferry of, the, of, of that era. And she was up in Brussels just before war was declared on the 4th of August at 11 p.m. And uh, that's a gutsy decision. She said, I have to go, my duty is with my nurses. And she knew very well that there were going to be lots of wounded um, and uh, so she wanted to be there to be with the nurses, as was appropriate as their manager and their, their teacher, but also to deal with the wounded. And she kept saying, you know, this is not where as nurses, we mustn't kind of specialize on one side or the other. We mustn't be partial. We nursing knows no frontiers. We've got to manage all these wounded, whoever they are coming into our hospital. Yes. I mean, she, she told she told her nurses. Um, any wounded soldier must be treated friend or foe. Each man is a father, husband or son. As nurses, they must take no part in the quarrel. Their work was for humanity. You know, once again, you know, she's not taking part in, in, the, in the, uh, the passions that are swirling around the nationalism and, and all of that about the war. Her focus was on people. I love this. Uh, isn't it? Sorry, it's that's so relevant today. Do you not think? Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that she didn't have patriotic feelings. I mean, she loved, she loved England, she loved Norfolk, and she, you know, she wanted to to care for its men. But but she she put that all in a wider perspective. Yeah. That you know, the, the cause of humanity was much more important than the cause of any particular country. And that prompted a, a, a small moral dilemma. 
as a discussion point <laughs> to move on to. Sorry, I've, I've missed that. That's okay. I was just saying that that is a moral dilemma for her. You know, she's in she's in Brussels. She's she's treated in Belgium. She's treating the wounded um, in the middle of a war. And what happened to her next? Well, uh, basically, a lot of our nurses left, went back to France and to Germany, uh, where they came from. Uh, most of our English nurses went as well, but she kept two or three. Uh, and she suddenly found that Depage himself, being a very eminent surgeon, knew that he needed to be nearer to the front and he needed to be in free Belgium. And there was a tiny bit of free Belgium right up on the coast. And he moved up there and set up a complete new hospital called La Panne and uh, worked there with his nurse wife uh, all through the war. Now, the wife died in the Lusitania in 1915, a very, very close friend of Edith. And that absolutely hit Edith between the eyes, really. Suddenly, this friend uh, who was coming back from uh, US with uh, funds for uh, the hospital in La Panne, uh, it was torpedoed, she drowned, uh, they found her body, and she was buried on the sand dunes at, at La Panne. Of course, Edith couldn't get there because it was she was in a war zone and uh, it wasn't possible to go across. So she knew something like COVID families today, that it isn't possible always to be with your loved ones at the time of their death. Um, and I, I, I find that very touching. So she, the, the numbers of patients coming to her, uh, Brussels lost a huge a chunk of its population. And well done, Britain, for taking many, many Belgians. 340,000 Belgians appeared in Britain all of a sudden. And no problems about asylum seekers and refugees putting them in concentration camps or anything else. We'll take them in and we'll look after them all the way through the war. And basically, Brussels was emptied quite considerably. But she kept on doing the nursing that she could there with the doctors that were still there. Um, and it was a relatively quiet period, you know, very stuck. They, they didn't know what had happened when the Germans arrived, the world changed, the German uh, kind of military world made them prisoners in their own city. But, um, you know, Edith was wondering, well, you know, am I, am I going to go on doing this? What can I, what can I do? And she did a lot of of helpful things for, for people who were around her in need, Belgians. But the crucial date is the 1st of November, 1914. And I think I'll hand over to Peter. She can, he can talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's, it's from that time that she became involved in an underground network of Belgian patriots who were trying to help allied soldiers who had been caught behind enemy lines uh, you know, if if they you know they they'd gone out on a on a on a recce or a sortie, and uh, you know not been able to, been separated from their units, um, however it was that these allies, uh, British, Irish, French, uh, Belgian as well, uh, and they didn't want to be caught by Germans and and sent to prison camps. They 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 wanted to to get out and perhaps had the possibility of getting back with their with their units to the front lines. And so this 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 network, I guess about 35 people or so, um, started to establish safe houses and secure routes for these um, soldiers to get to the Netherlands, which was a neutral country during this conflict. And so uh, once they got to the Netherlands, they they could you know move on to other places, um, back back to back to England, back to Britain, uh, particularly for for our own soldiers. And so. Uh, Edith's house became a key link uh, within this chain because she had, as Nick was pointing out before, had these cellars in the house where they could be, um, where they could be kept um, fed. She treated those with wounds. Um, so many amazing stories around, um, uh, around these, these incidents. I mean, for example, there was, um, you know, she was uh, worried that, that, um, um, German spies uh, might become uh, aware of what she was doing and and you know try to find more to infiltrate into into the network, and so she had to be suspicious of people when they came and presented themselves and saying I I am an English soldier and I I, you know, I need your protection, 
Um, and there's, there's a lovely story about one particular Norfolk soldier called Jessie Tunmore, who came to her and, and she was you know, trying to establish his bona fides. And um, he spotted on her wall a picture of Norwich Cathedral. And he said, oh, there's Norwich Cathedral. I grew up in Norwich. Uh, I know, you know, it's, you know, it's a picture of home for me. And, you know, Edith relaxed and, and uh, you know, was so delighted. She said, I, you know, I would do anything for, for a Norfolk man. Um, so he was one of those who um, was protected in her cellar, uh, got, got back out of uh, Belgium by the safe route. He even survived the war. And at, you know, at, at the time of Edith's um, funeral and burial here back in England, he was one of her, her pallbearers. So, you know, a, a, a remarkable stream of connections there, um, uh, all because, you know, established by a connection with Norwich Cathedral. Good, and it just happens that we've got a picture of Jesse Tunmore. Let's, let's move on two pictures from here, and you'll find the picture. That's it, men held by, helped by uh, Edith. Uh, the guy sitting in the, in the chair is, is, well, he was by that time, uh, Sergeant Jesse Tunmore. And the other guy on the right is another Norfolk man. The chap on the left is the very first man, a colonel from the Cheshire Regiment, who was the very first man who came with his sergeant. Uh, he was wounded, and they were the two that Edith had to make this snap decision. I think she probably expected it to happen, but she had to make the snap decision as they were there on the doorstep with a guide. Do I take them in or not? The implications are, if I take them in, then the Germans have put posters all around the city saying anybody who helps these people will be shot. And Boja, who you see on the left there, was in civilian clothing and wounded. And had they caught him in civilian clothing, the Germans would have taken the right, under the law of war at that stage, saying, this guy is clearly a spy. We will shoot him on the spot. Now, on the 1st of November, she had to make that decision. Do I let uh, make, uh, Boja and his, his sergeant in and look after them and put my own life on the line, or do I leave them on the streets putting their life on the line? And she said, with hardly a moment's hesitation, show them in. And that started nine months of looking after men like these ones in front of you. Uh, real Englishmen, Irishmen, some Frenchmen as well, and one or two Belgians who wanted to get out to uh, Holland in order to sign up with the Allies uh, because they're fed up with the Germans running over their country. And that's, that's nine months she did that work with it, over and uh, knowing each time that she helped anybody that there was a possibility of her being arrested and shot. They, it wasn't just, we were arrested and put you in prison of war camp. You will be shot, it said. And isn't it estimated and, she helped around 200 men? Yeah, now this is fascinating. She's a nurse used to keeping meticulous records. And she had meticulous records because she knew there would be money coming back from England in due course when the war was over to pay the hospital for the provisions that she'd bought for these men and the nursing equipment and all the rest of it that they needed. And she kept them all until literally the last two weeks of her life. Uh, there once there was a very close moment when uh, they, they nearly gave her away. But at that point, she realized things were really closing in. So she burnt the lot. And there's a tiny little bit left in the Imperial War Museum of one uh, part of her uh, record of these soldiers. If only we had that, then we would know who she looked after because she would have had names and regiments and everything else. And uh, when were they in her, her care, and so on. A meticulous Norwich historian of the 1970s spent ages finding out as much as he could, and he found 66 of what she admitted in the trial were 200 that she'd helped. But he writes in his book that probably her influence, not, not necessarily taking them into the clinic building that you saw, but actually looking after them at arm's length in somebody else's place or whatever, may have meant that she looked after about 900. So that's, that's the kind of reach we're talking over, nine months. 
But the crucial thing for me is that she, that dog you saw, and she used to go for a walk every morning and every evening at the end of work uh, on the streets. And occasionally she would take uh, the dog for the walk as usual, and behind her would be shuffling some chaps, one or more people. And he would take them out into the streets of Brussels and nod in the direction of a park bench or a street corner or a cafe. There was one particular cafe she used regularly, a corner table right in the back corner. And she knew she would leave them there and by arrangement, somebody else would come and pick them up and take them across to Holland. The guts of this woman to do that time after time, knowing each time a suspicious German chap on the... Uh, on the street might say, who's this? We're going to arrest you and find out more. I think the dog probably helped. It's called Jack, and he lived with her from 1910 until her death. And then uh, nurses tried to look after him in the new uh, nursing school, and he wasn't very friendly. Uh, and eventually he ended up living uh, out in the country and died in 1923 and was stuffed and then was sent to Norwich to live in a place, uh, Peter and I know well, where she there was a nursing a nurse's home uh, where he was kept in a glass case. And eventually that nurse's home was closed and they said, what should we do with a dog? And the Imperial War Museum said, we'd love him. And so he was in the Imperial War Museum for yonks. Uh, sadly, now they haven't got room for him, but he's still in their care in a box. <laughs> but uh, in the old days, the children used and it really brought the First World War alive to the children. I'm just thinking there's, before there's, we there's... move on to that, how um, with the rest, the end of her story, um, in effect, um, Father Peter, is there anything else you want to add at this point? Yeah, there, there's one story about her, um, you know, looking looking after these uh, soldiers, which which I love more than any other because um, you know soldiers being soldiers they weren't always very well behaved and they didn't like being cooped up in a cellar, even if it was for good reasons. And um, it's, it, you know, it's incredible to think of now, but sometimes she would have pity on them and let them go out in the evening. And there's a story about the soldiers, a few of the soldiers going to a corner cafe, which is still there at the end of the street where the clinic, where, where the clinic was. Uh, and um, having too much to drink and then uh, you know, closing time, making their way back to the clinic, singing It's a Long Way to Tipperary at the tops of their voices. Um, uh, so, you know, any idea of trying to keep them safe and secure was just, uh, well, anyway, it's <laughs> it's another age. It's, it's, it's difficult to imagine now. Mm. But but we, we, we shouldn't be surprised that the Germans found out about what was going on. No, and that, that's indeed what we're going to talk about next, is unfortunately Edith's story doesn't have a happy ending. So what, what did happen next to her? Well, they'd been sniffing around for really quite a long time, thinking there were strange things going on in the clinic and people moving in and out and so on. Um, they even put some, quotes, workmen in the road, making up the road, but they never did any work, but they were clearly spies. So the, all the staff in the clinic were well aware that this was not particularly clever. And they sent in people who, as Peter was explaining before, who had to make out that they were English soldiers or whatever. Um, and one of them got through the net. He was a very convincing Frenchman saying, I'm a French soldier, I want to get back to France. Um, Monsieur Kian, and he was crucial in the trial uh, of Edith. And he himself was later tried after the war. Anyway, um, the Germans eventually, having arrested the two ringleaders of the of the network, loose network, uh, they got a list of names of contacts of them uh, when they arrested them, and then they uh, pursued each of those contacts, and one of them was Edith. So on the first of August, she was arrested. Was it thirty first of August? Thirty first of July? I think it might have been fifth of August. 5th of August. I have okay. the official German account here right, go that on. I could read. Um, on August 5th, 1915, officers of the secret police presented themselves at the Institut Birkendale, Rue de la Culture, number 149, and there proceeded to a search. Miss Cavill and her head assistant, Miss Wilkins, were arrested and brought to police station B. 
After examination by Lieutenant Bergen, Miss Wilkins was released. Miss Cavill was detained. Yeah. And so from that, they put her in the main prison of Brussels called Saint Gilles. And I think there's a picture of that. Is there? Um, Picture, yeah. Got her prison, of her, a prison of her cell. There's a prisoner. One back one is a, a picture of the cell that she was put in. She was in solitary confinement for ten weeks in that cell, uh, with just two books, um, her prayer book and the life, the uh, imitation of Christ. Imitation of Christ. That's right, of, of Christ Thomas by Kempis. Thomas Akempis, which is something that she knew well, and she'd been reading all through her adult life. And she marked that in the course of the 10 weeks, things that really struck her in it. Uh, and it's fascinating to read it with the context that she knew she was in uh, and, and these annotations just saying, you know, this is speaking to me really importantly of what Thomas knew, what I know as a Christian and how I'm living through 10 weeks of solitary confinement. But she said, Later on, she said, uh, the night she died, I thank God for my 10 weeks in solitary confinement. Um, my life has always been so busy and I've actually had time to concentrate on higher things, which is great. Mm. And it's, it's also worth, worth noting, sorry, that, that that cell was actually preserved intact uh, within the prison until I think the 1990s. I mean, yep. really an extraordinary long time. It was, it was kept as a shrine to Edith. It was kept just as it was when she inhabited it. Now, if you, you imagine, uh, uh, you know, Wandsworth Prison or something like that, you know, maintaining a, a shrine, in, you know, with, you know, among its cells, it's, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, it was just a sign of how much the Belgians revered Edith and what they feel that she did for them. Um, so, you know, it isn't it isn't just a British thing, you know, saying how remarkable this woman was that that the Belgians recognized, you know, that this woman, you know, was, was prepared to die for them as well. Now, I was just going to say, I believe her copy of the Imitation of Christ is in the care yes. of the Cathedral. That's right. Yes, I can show it to you. Um, it's it's this. Um, and it's it's a it's an Oxford World's Classics edition, um, and it's got um, it's a, you know it's a bit a bit dog-eared and, and tattered. Uh, it's got um, it, there, there's Edith's you probably can't see it, but Edith's signature is there. Um, she had it sent to her cousin uh, Eddie Cavill, um, of whom she was very fond. Um, Yes, and and if if you go through the book, you'll be able to see uh, places where she's made uh, marks, annotations in the text with with parts of it that are you know, particularly um, important to her. I'm sorry, I can't find it at the moment, but there was a, a place that she marked on the morning that she died, uh, a text that that spoke to her in that in that terrible situation. Yeah. So it's it's something that is is very very precious memento of edith that we keep yeah real treasure um her faith was very important to her yes absolutely so uh central um and, and nick could say just about as much about this as i could i mean it's 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 quite amusing because of course she drew, grew up in a vicarage um and children of the vicarage always have a hard time one way or another i mean uh, um, and you know, she she wrote letters to her cousins about you know complaining about her father's sermons and how boring they were, and you know, she wished he wouldn't keep going on and on. But you know, nevertheless, that 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 early training, um, that early participation in faith was something that stayed with her throughout her life, um, and really defined who she was. You know, you know, gave a, a gave a reason for doing the work that she did. Um, was the heart and soul behind the way that she cared for people. And it very much defined the way that she lived and particularly the way that she died. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can you know, draw direct parallels uh, between uh, you know, her experience of her arrest and trial and execution and burial uh, and, and, and plot it on, on, 
on, on the passion of Jesus Christ. And in a sense that that was how she wanted to do it. She understood her life as an imitation of Christ and that you know, she was called to be Christ uh, you know, to the world, to the people that she was serving. So it really, you know, in a sense, it explains everything about her and why she did what she did. Nick, I don't know if you want to add something to that. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I've sat in the church where she's sat for all those times. Um, sermons are shorter and much better, I think. But <laughs> I, I really uh, wanted to spend time trying to understand her. So I wrote a tiny little booklet, it's only 10,000 words. It's on the imitation of Christ and what her life shows of that book in, in in the quotes from the book and then quotes from the gospels and the life of jesus and the the kind of way her life played out and it's exactly as, as peter said uh you can see the parallels all the way this service element this duty element this uh love for people and i mean one of the things that really just makes me choke every time i talk about her i always use this quote it's 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 in the last letter that he wrote she wrote to those nurses that have been with her all through the war and she's literally in the cell that you see writing this letter the night before at seven o'clock in the morning the next day she's going to be shot and she writes about things about nurse training and all the rest of it what she's tried to do for them with them and at the end of that she says um need my glasses she says well in in future life will be better which is a great thought in the middle of a pandemic too i always think um and basically when better days come our work will again grow and resume all its power for doing good that's what she's after that nursing is not just doing a job it's doing good i told you in our evening conversations that devotion would bring you true happiness and that the thought that before God you have done your duty well and with a good heart will sustain you in the hard moments of life and in the face of death. And then this extraordinary thing to say, literally the last sentence in the letter, she says, as their boss, as their trainer, as their co-worker, I may have been strict, she certainly was, I may have been strict, but I have loved you more than you can ever know. What an amazing, amazing thing for a, a, a woman to write. She's going to face her own death within a few hours. And she says to her nurses, I'm thinking about you. I'm encouraging you to do the things that I've done, to try and imitate Christ as I have done. But ultimately, I may have been strict, but I have loved you more than you can ever know. And I think she would find it difficult to say that head to head with them when she's in a nursing position and she's, you know, their boss and all the rest of it. But to write it in a letter like that, just, can you imagine being a nurse getting that uh, from your uh, boss? Just extraordinary. But I can tell you, I've seen nurses in, in today's world where that is exactly the same. Senior nursing figures are absolutely loving the job, loving the patients, and loving the staff who work with them. And bless them for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody could see, but I was tearing up as you were reading that. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of time, so let's, let's finish up her story. And then I want to talk a little bit, if we can, about her legacy, and then we'll get to some of the questions, because we've had some really, really insightful questions um, from you all at home. Um, so let's, let's finish. What, what happened, Edith? Well, she was taken from his cell on the 7th and 8th of uh, October to the room we've just, just missed. That's, that's it. That's the Senate chamber in Brussels still today. And the judges were all sitting up on those chairs on the dais. And she was down here on the left. And she was given roughly 10 minutes in front of that tribunal because she said, yes, I have taken 200 men and helped them to go to, the, to, the, to, to freedom. Um, and therefore, there was no case to discuss, really. Um, but that, that was the morning of the 7th. 
and she had to wait until the afternoon of the 11th for the sentence to be actually told her what would they do. I think most of the people in the, the group that was tried with her, 35 of them, expected some time in prison. And I think the, the fact that they, the Germans said they wanted to shoot seven of them, including Edith and two other women, and the other collaborators at the top of the, the network uh, was a complete shock. And uh, that's happened in the prison uh, where she was. And then that night uh, she thought she's gonna be shot the next morning and that was the end of it. But the faithful chaplain from the church that she attended in Brussels managed to get a pass to get into the uh, cell to see her and, and talk her talk to her and minister to her. Peter, would you like to take over there? Yeah, um, so it's Sterling Gahan was the name of the, the priest who attended her, a Northern, Ir uh, Northern Irish priest. And um, when he was in the cell, they, they had a talk, they celebrated communion together and uh, he gave her the sacrament. And then, um, and, and they together they res recited the, the hymn, Abide With Me. Um, and Sterling Gahan later recorded his experience of being with Edith in the cell, and he recorded these as some of her, her last words to him. She said, I have no fear or shrinking. I have seen death so often that it is not strange or fearful to me. Life has always been hurried and of difficulty. This time of rest has been a great mercy. Everyone here has been very kind. But this I would say, standing as I do in view of God and eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anyone. So and just a, you know, a, a remarkable thing to be saying. I mean, in effect, forgiving, forgiving her enemies before they're, you know, before they're about to shoot her. She, you know, once again, she sees things in a larger perspective um, that, you know, she's not focused on herself about her own experience. It's what she's learning about uh, the life of eternity, about her relationship with God, and that she knows she must be a forgiving person. And that if we want a world to be a world of peace, then we have to learn her lesson of having no hatred or bitterness towards anyone, including those who may be about to kill us. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the words that the, the dean and chapter of the cathedral have had carved onto her grave as really um, the, an eternal message that, that Edith spoke from a particular point in history, but which is of eternal truth and validity. And I think that's, you know, if there's nothing else that we remember about Edith. It's, it's those words that really need to stick. I'll tell you one other lovely thing that really touches me. I mean, that that try saying abide or singing abide with me with this vision of the two people in that cell tonight, that night. It just, just really gets to you. But the next morning, here she comes to the firing squad. Uh, she's taken by car to the Tia Nacional where they, they did all these executions over the years. And um, basically she... The, the man who is leading the squad of soldiers who are going to shoot her says something sort of, it's not clear what he said, but he probably said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do this. And she said, do your duty as I did mine. And then she said to the, the, the priest who was, was, was standing there by her, um, Tell my loved ones that I die in peace, and I haven't got the words in front of me, Peter, but something like that. And um, uh, I'm happy to die for God and for my country. And they shot her. Six six guys were were there, and they they shot her. And that was the end. She was buried literally, virtually where she where she fell, because that's how they did it in this particular place. And in 19 uh 19 they came and dug her up from there and she came back to england and we can talk about that in due course but that that was her end and there was no one there to to mourn her there was no one there to bury her it was all done very efficiently by the germans uh 
But the, the guy in charge, the medic in charge of saying that she was actually dead, certifying that she was dead, she said, he said, I, he, she went to her death in a matter, in a manner which I, I cannot, um, oh, I wish I could remember the words, um, which, which, yeah, which cannot be, it cannot be, um, I can't do it, sorry. Uh, come back, I'll, it'll come back to me. <laughs> That's okay. Hmm. Anyway, that was what happened. Sad end yeah. to the life of a, a woman who clearly put the lives of others above her own. And there was outrage, wasn't there, um, from well, from a lot of people, in fact. <laughs> I don't know whether either of you would like to touch on that a little. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a terrible story and reflection, really. But but of course the the uh, Allied authorities saw this as a propaganda coup because there was outrage around the world that this this woman, this helpless woman, uh, had been executed. I mean, it was a great it was a great you know propaganda tragedy for the Germans, but but a great you know, a victory for the. Uh, um, the, the allies and uh, Rudyard Kipling was among those who was you know advising the propaganda um, work and they started creating these images about uh, around Edith Edith's execution and showing uh, you know a German officer you know a Hun um, you know delivering the coup de grace sort of after she after she'd been been shot by all the soldiers he you know drew his pistol and and, and shot her in the head and this this became a you know a very popular postcard. Um, and uh, the British army used Edith's death as a as a recruiting drive. You know, avenge the death of Miss Cavill. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all the things that that Edith would have hated. Um, you know, her her memory was being exploited for the purpose of, of you know, furthering the war and furthering the killing and all of that. I mean, it's it's a it's a great sadness, but perhaps inevitable in the circumstances. And it shocked the Germans as well, didn't it? Yeah, I mean the Kaiser. Yes, it did. Well, I mean, it really, there was the, the Kaiser in Berlin heard about it and was absolutely appalled. Especially once the, the, the British press and, and around the world it went all over the empire and into the states. Um, and he said, "No woman shall ever be shot without my express express permission." Yeah. Yeah. Very, very sad. Um, I am conscious of time, as I said, and that we've had some really, really good questions. So do you mind if we move on to those, if that's all right? Mm, uh, please do. Let's scroll back up to the top and get some of those done first. Now let's have a look and see what we've got here. Um, let's, let's, okay, I'm just scrolling through them now. Okay, so we've got a question from Josephine. It says, how do you know about the letter that was written the night before she was executed? So how do we know that's even in existence? I imagine Josephine's talking about the letter to her mother um, because I think she had discussed with Gayan, I've got these letters, can you take them for me? Um, and or, or maybe she didn't, and, and I'm not sure, the prison authorities. Anyway, it was known that there was a letter to her mother among the letters including the one to the nurses that i read a bit of um and she wrote to sister wilkins who was her number two saying please organize this this and this in her usual efficient manner you know oh, i happen to be dying tomorrow but you know, nevertheless look after the look after the funds etc cetera, etc cetera. that's all i can tell you i'm sorry i don't have any more detail about that letter Peter, anything from you before we move I on? To no, I, I can't add anything to that, no, sorry. <laughs> um, so a question from Roz, um, what happened to the rest of her family? Do we know? Yep, uh, one sister never married and went into nursing like her and uh, was, was still nursing at the time of her death. Second sister was also a nurse and married a very high up uh, medic in one of the other London hospitals and her mum, uh, Edith's mother, went to live with them uh, down near London uh, for her final years. And finally there was a brother, I don't know if people remember, there was a brother in that picture with uh, the father and the mother and he lived 
uh, as a single man all the time in Norwich and used to work for Norwich Union, edited their house magazine uh, and uh, died here. So that's the rest of the family. My father died in 1910 after having retired in 1909 after 46 years as vicar here. And the mother died in 1918 uh, with that other daughter. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Miko, who says, is it true that German soldiers refused to take part in her execution and they were executed as well and buried near her grave? Peter. Well, as, as I understand it, and, and Nick, please correct me if I'm wrong, that this was one of the, the, the legends that, that sprung up around, around her death um, and that there doesn't seem to be any actual evidence that this took place, but it was one of the stories that, that came up um, as, as people elaborated on the events, um, yeah. you know, along with the German soldier, uh, the German officer delivering the coup de grace. This was another, um, you know, at, attempt to, to elaborate on her memory. Make it all the more shocking, really. Yeah, um, the, the, there is a name of a private rambler, but it's it's very convoluted story as to whether it might have happened or not happened, but uh, doesn't seem to be very likely. <coughs> the next one we've got here is from Daphne. Did the powers that be in the UK know about the trial? And if so, did they do anything to help? Good question. Very good question. Um, they did know about the trial. They couldn't do much to help. They didn't have, obviously, any diplomatic representation in Belgium. The American legation did what they could after they knew she'd been arrested. Uh, and so did others. Um, and there was quite a lot of diplomatic activity. Spanish. Yeah, that's, that's right. The Go Spanish on. ambassador in particular was, was tried very hard to prevent, to prevent her from being executed. Yeah. Yeah, but the Germans wouldn't listen. I mean, it was the decision to execute her was the, the military commandant of Brussels. And um, there's, a, there's a, an account that, that he, his, his own son had been killed earlier in the war and that you know, his determination to, to kill Edith and others was in a sense a, 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 you know, a sign that he was unhinged by his own personal tragedy. Yeah. Um. That's absolutely the, the story, but uh, they did do everything they could. But as the sentence was only made public at three o'clock on Monday afternoon and she was shot at seven o'clock in the morning, or some say two o'clock in the morning, and I don't think that was right. But seven o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, there wasn't a lot of living room there. And the American ambassador in particular was uh, actually very sick at that time. Brand Whitlock, if people want to look up the stuff in the history books, he was the man who did what he could and he wrote a full account of it, so. Okay, next question we've got is from Kate, who says, when Edith was exhumed, it is said it was incorrupt. I'm not sure if it means incomplete. Is this true? Well, as, as, as I understand it, uh, yes. And, and uh, there were photographs uh, taken uh, of I mean, her and presumably others as they were exhumed. Um, so yes, the, the, the coffin was opened and a photograph was taken and, you know, the, the skin was intact. Uh, she was recognizable um, you know, for, for those who knew her in life, she was identifiable in death. Um, and it's, it's said that it was extremely unusual that, that her body should survive in those conditions so that normally a body would decompose you know, within a year, within a year or two, and she'd been she'd been in that grave for for four years before she was exhumed. So, yeah. I'm not sort of making any claims about it, but it it does seem to be a medical fact. Yeah. Uh, next one we've got is from Stephen, and um, this actually ends her story now quite nicely, I believe. Is Edith now at rest at Norwich Cathedral? She is indeed. Um, that it was at the request of her family when, when she was brought back from Belgium that she should be buried at the cathedral. Um, and uh, so she uh, was laid to rest, not inside the cathedral, but outside. I think this was also the family's uh, request um, in the part of the cathedral close known as Life's Green, which was when the cathedral was a monastery, this was the monastic burying ground. Um, so she's 
um, her her grave is in a in a in a, a rather sheltered position in in the corner of, you know between a chapel and the apse uh, of of the cathedral, um, and yes, and and uh, her memory is treasured there. We have many people come to visit her. We have an annual commemoration of, of on the day of her execution when the the British Legion and the nurses and uh, the Belgian ambassador and other uh, local dignitaries come together to 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 register their thanks for the life of this remarkable woman, and um, and and. And within the cathedral itself, I mean, she's really very much treated as a modern modern day saint and uh, and Christian martyr, uh, which is uh, you know, which is hard for some people to get their minds around, but but something we feel quite quite firmly about. And I think I've got one more question, and then we'll move on to some closing thoughts. I think I think we've come quite nicely full circle there. And um, last question we've got is from Josephine, and she says, there must be many books written about Edith. Which would you recommend to give to my 15-year-old granddaughter, please? Well, I haven't got the book in front of me and the exact reference, but if I can have the lady's address, I know there's an American author who is watching this, because she's already come up on the thing on the side, and uh, she has written a lovely book for... Um, children of this sort of age, which I'd love to send her a copy of, which I've got here. So if whoever has the details for Josephine Smith, I need a, a, a postal address and she can have Terry Arthur's excellent uh, paperback book, 15-year-old uh, granddaughter. I think we'll love it. Fantastic. That's lovely. Thank and, you. And could I uh, mention uh, another book, which has been, been written by uh, Janet Marshall, who's uh, been our head of schools and family learning at the cathedral, um, it's probably for slightly young, younger children, 10 or 12 years old, perhaps. But I, I, it's Janet Marshall, and I believe it's called One More Step, Jack. So it's really, it's seeing Edith's life through, through, the, you know, through her relationship with Jack. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lovely story. It really is very well done. Yeah, it's good. Fantastic. Well, I think, yeah, I think that brings us really nicely to the end. Um, Father Peter, do you have any closing remarks, any any further thoughts that you'd like to share with our lovely audience today? Well, to, to thank them for their interest in Edith um, and the hope that it, it, you know, our discussion has encouraged them to want to find out more about Edith because there's there's a lot more out there and she's a, a truly remarkable woman. I think they could also say that, you know, through the time I've spent studying her and reading her correspondence, you no, know, she, she, she's a living person uh, and a, and a wonderful, wonderful companion through life. I would, I couldn't echo that more firmly. You know, I didn't know anything about her when I moved into this village. I saw her picture at the end, uh, her a stained glass memorial to her in our east window in that church, and I said, I've got to find out about this woman. I've read everything I can, and everything I read, the more I read it. She's not, she's not a, you know, a total saint in every way. She's quite tough. She's actually uh, quite demanding. And some thought she was very stiff and starchy and she wasn't very approachable, et cetera, et cetera. But she had missions in life to get on and do. But underneath, there's a, a very warm heart, as evidenced by that letter to the nurses. And, I mean, the fact that she brought in all the children that she could find for Christmas Day in Brussels in 1914 to give them a good time because they were all struggling with no food and all the rest of it. She really put herself about for that. All sorts of evidence of this woman being very special. And I I think in, in some ways, I mean, as a Christian, I model my life on that of Jesus. But to have her as a person that is kind of more contemporary that I can, can get alongside is very, very exciting. And I, I commend her to our listeners uh, and get the books about her. Diana Suhami is the latest uh, full biography done in 2010. It's in paperback, very, very comprehensive, very nicely done. But I personally feel that Diana, and I've told her this because I read the thing in that draft for her, uh, Diana misses out uh, some of the Christian element to it, and that's why I wrote my little book. Anyway, that's that's basically where she is for me, and that's why I, I'm here today after follow, being her, quotes follower in face, Facebook terms for 
uh, 20 years, I suppose. So thank you very much for the time with you and your audience. It has been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you both, Father Peter and Nick, um, for coming on as our guests today. It's been a, a really, really eye-opening hour and a bit. Um, thank you also at Norwich Cathedral, um, to Emma Knight, who helped organise this, and also to Emily Miller. Really, really um, appreciate your help with that. Thank you to everybody who's joined us at home. Thank you for the insightful comments and questions. Please let us know if you'd like to see more like this. I've already seen a comment earlier on about more sessions around individual historical figures. So if you've got any suggestions, please pop them into the comments. Um, remember, if you do have anything you'd like to share about Edith, whether your ancestor came across her, maybe they were treated by her, maybe they mentioned her in a letter or a diary, please get in touch with Nick at edithcavill.org.uk. And I hope you all have a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Father Peter, and thank you, Nick, as well. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.